This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. All right. Welcome, everyone. We are at one o'clock on this wonderful Friday afternoon in sunny but a little bit chilly New York City. I know you're not all in New York, but uh, but it feels like you are with with everyone in front of me. Uh, today we have Roger Saboni, who is a recognized and widely respected leader uh, with more than 30 years of experience um, uh, uh, in um, business leadership uh, that focused on executive level management and technology and finance. Uh, apparently that BS that you got in business admin from uh, UC Berkeley, Roger, has paid off, so that's great. Uh, but most importantly, he was the president of the American Numismatic Society from 2008 until 2012. Uh, he is the lead author of the book, New Jersey State Coppers, along with Jack Howells and Abe Buell Ish, uh, which was co-published by the INS and C4 in 2013. He has also published dozens of articles for the C4 newsletter, the Colonial Newsletter, which is now Gene, uh, the MCA Advisory and the Asylum, and has presented at the famed Coinage of the Americas conference in the past. Addi additionally, Roger hosts his own annual conference on colonial numismatics, which has become nothing short of legendary in their own right. Today, Roger will present the Franco-American Castrillon Jeton. So please take it away, Roger. Thank you. I like to start with uh, a phrase that uh, I think I first learned or picked up or, or resonated with me from uh, David Bowers when Dave was doing his old rare coin review, he used to talk about the caviar of coins. He'd refer to certain coins that he'd feature as the caviar of numismatics. I remember once being struck by uh, him referring to the pine tree shilling as the caviar of colonial coins. And that caviar of coins idea kind of has always stuck with me. And frankly, when I first started collecting some 30 plus years ago, um, and I started branching out of New Jersey coppers. Um, one of the first areas I looked at were colonial American metals. And in the colonial American medallic art, you know, three coins struck me as, as truly caviar of coins because of their artistry, because of their rarity, sophistication, the beauty of the engraving. It was the American uh, Libertas Americana, the Middleton token, and then the Franco-American jeton. And, and the Franco-American jeton was, in fact, the first colonial medal I purchased. I really didn't know anything about it other than it looked like one of the caviar of medals for, Franco, for America, and it had this beautiful imagery on it. I purchased it from a well-known... Um, very um, reputable dealer who explained to me that it was important that it was original and this was an original and that it was, you know, in, in better grade for, for how these things come. And really other than being beautiful and a caviar of medallic art, that was all about all I knew about it when I first purchased it. But as my um, collecting grew, I extended well beyond New Jersey's into general colonial type and, colonial medals. Um, my library expanded. I started putting together a collection um, of literature related to colonial American numismatics. I began to learn more about this beautiful medal. I, I mean, of course I knew it was an, uh, of unrivaled artistry, being one of the caviar of medals, but I found that it was engraved by the famous uh, Paris Mint master, um, chief engraver, for the Paris Mint, Benjamin Duvivier, who we know for engraving our first Comita Americana medal, our first medal of honor, if you will, for Washington before Boston. And as I ultimately came to find out, was actually one of the original subscribers, one of the original royalist subscribers uh, to the Casterland project. Um, I also found that the medal itself depicted one of the most interesting historical events following the American Revolution uh, that was taking place during the French Revolution and its reign of terror. And, you know, noblest were, you know, fleeing for their lives and looking at America that in their minds, they helped finance to be a new republic. Um, and we're reading things like uh, Jean de Crevecourt's Letters from an American Farmer, a famous Frenchman, 
that migrated to uh, America and came back, but wrote letters of, you know, the beauty and marvels of living in bucolic uh, farmland America. So there was, you know, this, um, you know, um, reign of terror going on and a possible place for them to escape in paradise. Um, while when I purchased it, I, I thought it was just simply a nice metal. I came to find out through research that actually it originally circulated probably as compensation. Um, also, I think potentially commemoration, at least for different different forms of uh, uh, the metallic content. And, and it even possibly circulated as currency in this new um, idealized um, French Republic. And virtually some of the most distinguished numismatist authors uh, through time, I've listed just a few, would give you a strong opinion that it was one of the three, a combination of the two, but everything's been contemplated. Um, as we'll go on, um, I think it ended up in one way or another being all three. Um, now, while this metal is not only gorgeous, um, it turned out to be one of the most prolific metals of the Paris Mint, um, being struck from 1796 to their periodically uh, restriking copy dies today. Um, and even though this is a fascinating bit of history, it was at a time of great upheaval in France. And as we'll talk about, it was less than, uh, though well-planned and executed, far less than successful. In fact, it was a disaster that was quite short-lived. And, you know, even in France, people misunderstood what this was all the way through the 1850s, thinking up until the 1850s that this was actually part of the Napoleonic metal series. So you see here the Castor land as being one of the Napoleonic metals. And um, as we'll talk about, I think one of the reasons, and um, Jesse and David Hill were helpful to me in finding a little bit more collabora uh, corroboration for this. Um, I think for a while, um, those, uh, those collectors in France thought it was part of the Nape Napoleonic metal series that they had to have one of, which explains the dozens and dozens of strikings and restrikings and copy dies that went on with this metal. But it's true history, the, the full knowledge about what the Cashland project was, was really kind of a mystery until a chance discovery in a Paris bookstore in the 1860s by the famous colonial numismatist William Sumner Appleton, who ran across the actual original Casterland journal, its uh, sales prospectus, and its constitution in France in the junk bin of a French bookstore. And not just the junk bin, the one that's being discarded to recycle for more paper. Appleton saw Casterland, vaguely understood what it said in France, thought it was important enough to acquire it and donated it to the Massachusetts Historical Society. They, um, they contacted and collaborated with the famous uh, New York State historian Franklin B. Huff through his um, books on Jefferson and Lewis, the history of Jefferson, Lewis and County, Jefferson and Lewis counties, which included all the Anirandak lands. Um, was overwhelmed by this and literally spent the balance of his career to his death translating the original journal into English. And while he did incorporate some of it into later editions of his histories of Lewis and Jefferson County, it wasn't until Edith Pilcher put together the definitive book on the Casterland that brought together all of his research and what we found from the English translation. Now, people today that have a better understanding of what the Castrolan Jeton is and understanding that it was a failed French project have this kind of idea that it was these 
flighty French nobility that were just trying to escape the reign of terror and just bumbled their way into a bad real estate deal um, to have some sort of idealized bucolic American agrarian social paradise in upstate New York. They were viewing this as a chance to escape to what they believed was a new French Republic in America that they were going to settle with um, a very welcoming um, um, American, uh, welcoming and thankful American society. It didn't quite work out that way, um, but it was far from being ill-conceived and a bunch of flailing nobility just trying to escape. It was conceived by Pierre Chazanis, uh, a member of the French court, a well-respected real estate developer in France. He conceptualized this, conceptualized this, bringing together some of the greatest French merchants, uh, people from the French court, and negotiated with some of the uh, most respected American businessmen and real estate developers of the time and put together, in fact, uh, probably an overly detailed, overly thought out plan to truly build a French oasis in America, including, you know, not just selling real estate and having homes, but lanes, marketplaces, places for people to gather, a true paradise. And he put it together in painstaking detail, negotiating for over a year with a gentleman by the name of William Constable, who was kind of the largest owner of Anirondack lands. They originally were looking for 600,000 acres to put together for this paradise, but after careful negotiation and getting the ideal piece of land, uh, the perfect place to settle, they settled and, and also getting a better sense of the number of subscribers they would have. They settled on 200,000 perfect acres acquired for the company, the Combined in New York in 1793. They divided the land into two parcels, two 100,000 parcel, 100, acre parcels. The first 100,000 acres uh, was subdivided and sold to 41 subscribers. The other 100,000 acres were held back, let's call it the non-waterfront property, was held back and was going to be optioned out at um, 21 years after the initial commencement of the company when the, the, the new French Republic would be thriving, everybody would be living in paradise, the value of the property would go up multifold. I was lucky to acquire one of the only two remaining land deeds for the Casterland Company. This is for the first 50 acres. This is for the option for the second 50 acres. And as I said, not only was the journal of the heroic men that tried to establish the Casterland um, in the journal, but also the prospectus for sale, um, all the marketing material and the constitution of the company was in the book. And there were actual, I was also able to run across this, one of the original subscription documents that they used to market this land. And it talked about, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity to acquire, you know, this amazing Franco-American property that uh, if you invest in, that's all you'll see is your investment multiply in time. Um, unfortunately, even with the best information of the time, and they truly were working with state-of-the-art maps. At that time, around 1779, the Sothers map was considered the best map of upstate New York. But as with everything at that particular time in history, while the major cities were pretty well known, the wilderness between New York and Lake Ontario was probably a little underestimated, but this was the map that was used by Chansonese and a uh, constable to negotiate the 200,000 acre land purchase. And as you can see, it has a few faults. First of all, it's the Black River going into a very easy, comfortable part of Lake Ontario uh, is kind of one feature. Uh, secondly, they thought the Black River 
where the land would go across was traverse the entire state. And here you have right about here where the Castor land property, the 200,000 acres was negotiated. And interestingly, you see on the map, and this was, uh, this was pointed out by Souther in his map, that this is the land of beaver and otters, plentiful beaver and otters. And so Chazanese decided to name the property in the Campagne de New York, Castor land, Castor being beaver and French. So it was the land of beavers that you'll see portrayed on the jeton. But the reality of what was really there was not quite what was idealized. And what they soon found out after getting to America, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is it's a tough slog all the way to Albany, which is at that time was fairly well settled. But from Albany all the way to the Black River, <clears throat> There's a lot of pure wilderness. And as you can see, almost parallel to Lake Placid. So not only was there massive untamed wilderness, but it was damn cold. <laughs> and so once they got past Albany, they're at Schenectady, it's not looking too good. By the time you get to Utica, it's pretty bad. There's nothing there. They get to Rome, that's the end of everything. And they still have to get all the way up to the Black River. This is about where the Castor land was. As you can see, the Black River didn't run smoothly across the state, but was short-lived. It was tough going rapids and almost impossible to access Lake Ontario. So although well-researched, well-planned, incredibly well-planned, with some of the most competent people in France and America, the underlying facts that they were relying on were just completely wrong. And so Chazanis and his very smart group of four French commissioners, leading merchants of the day, put together a very detailed set of instructions and procedures for real estate development and communal social order, exacting blueprints for what to do step by step. In fact, so well researched, so detailed that part of the failure was the unwavering, unchangeable instructions and the inability to uh, reset once they got uh, the commissioners that they hired got to America. And nevertheless, they did put this together along with, as I said, it contained not just the, the journal, but the prospectus and the constitution or bylaws for um, the Casterland Company or the, uh, the uh, Combine to New York. It laid out the structure for the French commissioners. It laid out the operating management and control procedures, the requirement to go back to France for any changes, on and on, incredibly detailed. But interestingly, in the journal itself, and this is something that just doesn't seem to be picked up enough, it called for the actual manufacture and creation of the jetons as compensation or trois de présence, a fee for being present, kind of like board of director fees for jetons. It was to be paid to each of the uh, French commissioners, Chansonny and his four co-commissioners. It was payable on a per meeting basis. And while it was authorized in great detail to be about four or five grows of silver, uh, which is approximately equivalent to a then French half ecu or an American half dollar or a couple of days wages at the time to be paid two at a time at each meeting. Interestingly enough, while they were quite specific about <clears throat> the silver jetons, there was no mention of a copper or brass jeton, which were ultimately made. So looking at this droit de présence that were to be issued, and by the way, they were to be issued with images designed by the commissioners who undoubtedly did this in conjunction with Duvivier, and I'll show you why in a bit. Um, 
they designed these jetons that, as I said, are quite beautiful. Franco-American colony, Franco-American colonia, with the head of Sibel, the Roman goddess and great mother of earth, with her crown representing her conquering the wilderness and nature and bringing earth under the domain of mankind. Good luck with that. <laughs> and at the bottom, you'll see Duvivier's initials, his mark. And underneath that, Casterland, land of the beaver, and the date 1796. The reverse is even more magnificent in my eyes. Salve magna parens frugum. Hail, great mother of fruits, great mother of heroes from Virgil. The central device is the goddess Ceres, who is the goddess of agriculture, grain, crops, fertility, and motherly relationships. To her left, a cornucopia of fruits, vegetables, of plenty that you'd find in this Franco-American paradise, so much so that she carries with her a wimble in her hand that she can drill into a tree and have maple flow into a bucket just at the right. And once again, below the exergue, Exerg. a beaver. So, this French Republic expedition to America, incredibly well-conceived, well-staffed by the five Paris uh, commissioners and also two new French, Amer uh, two French commissioners that were going to set sail to America, Desjardins and Faro. Desjardins was a member of the French court, a well-regarded French businessman and experienced real estate developer. Faro was considered somewhat of a genius engineer and architect. But nevertheless, with all of this, and facing this, it all turned into essentially a failed Lewis and Clark expedition. And Desjardins and Faro worked tirelessly to make it work. But when they got there and everything turned out to be different than they thought, they enlisted the help of every American hero and founding father of the revolution. Benjamin Franklin was involved, George Clinton, Governor Morris, Thomas Jefferson, Baron von Steuben, even Alexander Hamilton was employed for legal work. But everything that could go wrong did go wrong. They vastly underestimated the stretch of wilderness in the cruel winters. Um, they were unable to sell the additional subscriptions they had hoped for in America, so they ran short of money. And even without what little money they had was stolen from them along their journey up to the Castor land. Faro, the genius architect and engineer, died in a rapids boating accident crossing the Black River attempting to get to the Castor land. And finally, this perfect 200,000 uh, acre land parcel that they had perfectly configured for ideal development turned out to be not quite what they expected. Nevertheless, the detailed plans given to uh, Desjardins and Faro required them to build things exactly as designed on the plans. But as it turned out, this is what they thought they were buying when they got to the castor lands and their property, this is what they ended up getting. So it wasn't exactly divide up the first 100,000 of riverfront parcels and then leave the back half. It was almost impossible to construct this idealized paradise in the land they had. But the good news was that they never got more than about a dozen um, workers and settlers to the property in any event. But again, everything went wrong. Chazanis ultimately, you know, only getting periodic messages from Desjardins about how bad things were. And then finally, when Faro died, had had enough. He fired Desjardins and replaced him with Rudolf Teller, a well-known Swiss businessman 
to uh, some of the creditors of the Casterland project in Desjardins. But Teller turned out to be, when I say quite a schemer, I'm being generous. Um, he focused on his own self-interest. He was all about making money for himself. And as in all bad business ventures, everyone turned on each other, recriminating stories back and forth. And all of this is detailed in the journal. Ultimately, the Casterland properties were sold off to an array of early investors, sold back to an array of some of the early investors, some Swiss creditors, and frankly, some Americans who were far more accustomed to um, settling in, in wilderness, especially the complex and treacherous New York and Arandak wilderness. So this thing ultimately started in 1793. By the early 1800s, the project was effectively abandoned. And by 1814, the company was dissolved. But as I, as I began to really understand this and, and understand the story and understand that the later strikings of this jeton were probably more for collectible medallic purposes, it became clear that if you wanted to collect something, you wanted to collect one of the original, one of the original jetons made from the original Benjamin Duvivier dies that were made for and at the direction of the company, no doubt between Chausanese and Duvivier. They were obviously more historical, more valuable, and uh, than those issued as restrikes and ultimately copy dies by the Paris Mint. But the challenge over virtually the last century has been, or at least three quarters of a century, has been assessing which of these many, many jetons that have been issued were truly originals made by the company for droit de présence um, or for commemoration or to bring for use as currency in the Casterland. And trying to distinguish the pure originals from which ones are restrikes and which ones are copy dies has been a challenge through, as I said, virtually a century. And you can get catalogs today that will tell you every kind of story you can imagine, and there is no consistency. So this is what I tried to attack. Uh, interestingly, in doing some research, I was able to find Benjamin Duvivier's sketchbook um, that is housed in uh, the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris. And in his sketchbook, you see the actual die that he conceptualized with Desjardins. And it took me a bit to figure this out. I was worried that maybe someone else made this, but it says execute. And uh, Duvivier was thrown out of the Paris Mint in 1791. This is all of his sketches of all of his dies. All dies past 1792 did not have execute, but this was the only one that somehow they got through. And the way things worked back then was you executed the die, brought it to the Paris Mint, it became the property of the Paris Mint, and you would contract striking medals. So we know that they were made at the Paris Mint. We know that they, that Duvivier uh, did the die, and we know it was executed. So now we have to distinguish between what was really a historic object that was issued by this company for its operation, and what were these later copies? And I think the first place to start for me, and the easiest place to start, is Let's just simply distinguish between what is an original Duvivier die and what is a copy die that's being, that started being made in the 1830s for the reverse and a bit beyond that for the obverse. But it's pretty, for me, there's a couple of really obvious tells between what is an original Duvivier die and what is a Paris Mint copy die. And on the obverse, the first tell 
is that the one in 1796, the bottom is actually embedded in the denticles. Also, in the copy die, and as you can see in the copy die, they fix that. Also, Duvivier's initials are down along the exergue, whereas in the original die, it's under the bust. So these two things will help you instantly distinguish whether you have an original or copy obverse. On the reverse, um, the legend, though magnificent, was a bit long. And as you can see, Duvivier ran out of room a little bit, so the letters are scrunched. In particular, the U and G are touching. The copy die, which, as I said, was uh, the reverse die was the first die to collapse. So the copy die that was made circa 1830s, 1840s, has the legend properly spaced. So that's how you can tell an original Duvivier reverse die from a copy die. Now, trying to determine which of the original dies were made by the company, by Chazanese and Duvivier uh, for use for the company as droit de présence, perhaps as commemoration dies, and ev even even if they weren't meant to circulate by being compensation as droit de présence, did ultimately end up going into circulation, which is why over half the examples you run across uh, exhibit quite a bit of rare, uh, quite a bit of wear on them. Um, but trying to distinguish which is the original dies versus which of the subsequent restrikes, the many, many, many restrikes, perhaps because, as I said, they were trying to fulfill the need for putting together a Napoleonic metal collection, is a challenging task. But like the difference between a original die and a copy die, there are some tells. And the tells really revolve mostly around the reverse, because the reverse die is the one that failed far before the obverse die and showed the tells of wear. So if you're looking for diagnostics on what might be an original die, you want to look at the one that has the earliest die characteristics. And in this regard, there's two things that I like to look at and that many other scholars have commented on. Um, first, on the vessel that gets the sap from the maple tree, an original first strike that was clearly made by Chazani and Duvivier has no spalling around the handle. Virtually after the first striking, the underlying metal in the die was obviously impure and it starts spalling. And unlike rust, you can't just polish away spalling, it comes back. And so the earliest dies, no spalling, but probably starting with the second striking, you get a little bit of spalling and it grows and grows and grows until finally in the latest state of the dies, the spalling extends all the way to the legends. Likewise, in the legend itself at Perrin's, oh, probably midway-ish in the original die restrikes, a break begins to form because there's a V bulge that happens from, this would be around her hand with the Wendell all the way to the bucket, you see a V forming, which begins to form a break that you see about midway through the restrikes. Towards the end, this gets worse and worse and worse until ultimately you get catastrophic failure. So, well, many authors have questioned whether the Jetons actually ever circulated as issues of the company. I think the bylaws make it clear, and uh, Duvivier's sketchbook make it pretty clear they did. 
while it specified that there was silver ones to be made, by looking at dye states, you can find, though they're quite rare, several copper uh, castrolin jetons that are of the earliest dye state with no spalling, no break. Likewise, there's one brass piece in existence that is of the earliest dye state, uh, no spalling, no break. I think that the silver ones were, in fact, uh, jetons de présence. The copper ones, I believe, were probably made as commemorative pieces, either to market to prospective investors this great French Republic bucolic paradise, or maybe given to each one of the subscribers as a keepsake. And I think the single brass piece was probably made as some sort of remembrance token for the company itself. But since you do see, um, uh, you do see wear on about over half of the uh, significant wear on over half of the silver ones, and probably more than more than a third of the copper ones. These were because they were, you know, equivalent in size to a half ec uh, to a, an echo or a half dollar. Um, they probably took the the um, droit de présence, and when they were done with it, spent it. And likewise, big nice piece of copper probably spent that too, and they did ultimately circulate. So, again. Um, explaining what happened and what was there, but again, a bit of a mystery of which ones are really related to the company, in my mind, truly valuable, and which ones were later restrikes that they just cranked out, probably more valuable if an original Duvivier die and probably less valuable as a copy die. And the marketplace more or less respects the difference between original dies and copy dies. The marketplace more or less respects uh, later um, heavy spalling, heavy die breaks versus earlier ones, but really never focused on which ones were truly original and why. Now, um, I've had the good fortune over the last several years to come across quite a few early jetons, several very large colonial collections that had uh, many, many uh, early Castrolan jetons in them. The, the EPU sale, the Don Partrick sale, the Sid Martin sale. Um, Tony Terranova had an extensive collection that I was able to acquire. All of this allowed me to um, collect about 15 of them and examine over a hundred of them. And as I did that, and as I began to look at the evolution of the die state, how the spalling evolved, how the uh, break in parents evolved, I was able to kind of come across what I thought to be six clear states of the die, six different places where you can see, you know, they probably went to to strike and restrike. And as I said, reason tells us that the earliest ones without any spalling or any break are the original ones struck by the company. But I did find some things that were kind of interesting as I examined these hundred dies, and I'll talk about it in a sec. Um, when we look at what's original, John Ford probably took the most conservative approach at talking about what was original and what was true to the company. He called them Simon Pure dies. Now, I had read that from time to time, but didn't know what it was until I started doing my research. And Simon Pure actually connotes uh, something that is absolutely pure, genuine, and authentic. And I, I asked myself and with another person I was talking to about this, I wonder where he got that. So we started looking and we found the reference comes from a 1717 American play entitled Bold Stroke for a Wife by Susan Centalieve. So 
interesting that a woman wrote a play in 1717 that gave us Simon Pure original dyes. No spalling, no break. But I kind of asked myself, so are the only ones that are truly collectible to the company, the Simon Pure ones? Or is there something earlier uh, or later that can be included? And I did run across a cliche in the Martin sale that I'm actually kicking myself for not getting that was no doubt made by Duvivier and is Simon Pure on the reverse. In addition, and looking at the various collections in my own, I found three plain edge copper, um, uh, plain edge uh, copper uh, pieces ranging from VF to EF in condition that are the earliest of earliest die states, probably preceded the silver ones and no doubt were probably patterns used by Duvivier. Um, I also started noticing that, and here's the cliche, Simon Pure. I also noticed on these original early copper ones that they used a crude edge that was neither here nor there on these three early die state ones. And unlike the very earliest readed edges for the Simon Pure ones. So here's the cliche. Here's an early trial die. And while it was safer to go with Simon Pure, I did notice something from the six die states. In particular, I started looking at die state one and two, and I noticed a few things. First, and by die state one, that's Simon Pure, die state two has no break at the S, but just a small amount of spalling around the handle. I noticed that every one of them, silver and copper, were of reeded edge, and they were all coin turn, as if they were money. Then I went to start researching whether I got really excited, and I said, wait a minute, is coin turn like even something that people thought about in the 1700s? But I was able to go back and find out that the Paris Mint did embrace the concept of coin turn and metal turn. It was embraced by the Mint at that point in time, and what you find is die states three and six are almost exclusively metal turn. So you begin to think that if these things were mainly compensation, droit de présence, if they're coin turn, they were made as money. If they're metal turn, they're made as Napoleonic metals or some kind of metal. And I actually went back into my own collection to find some French pieces that were truly money, the 15 sole coin turn, the um, Merlton coin turn. So it's easy to dismiss die state two as not being part of the originals assigned to the company, but it's hard to dismiss that they're all coin turn and that they're all crudely readed. And then as you think about the history, well, I think in the beginning, they thought this was going to be some pretty easygoing board work. I've been on a few boards where everything goes right. You meet four times a year, everything's great. But when things go bad, you're meeting all the time. I could remember meeting, you know, every day of the week for months on certain boards. And so it's possible that they had to go back to the Paris Mint and perhaps do one more striking in coin turn to create enough droit de présence to compensate Chazanis and his four co-commissioners in France for all the work they were doing trying to salvage the castor land. Um, and when you look at a dye population study, I'll look at, uh, I'll show you in a few minutes, it kind of works historically. Um, I've talked to some people that said, well, wouldn't they have struck all that they needed in the initial first batch and that was it? But as I said, events happen, 
things change. And history tells us that they probably did need a second batch. Now, just to complete the die state analysis, as you go to metal turn and die states three, four, five, and six, it's clear the die sat around for a period of time, the spalling got worse. It's clear as they began to strike, the break got worse to the point where it ultimately did collapse. But the Paris Mint and its need to keep on cranking these things out actually started making uh, jetons of the castor land with the original obverse Duvivier die. And a copy die from the Paris Mint of the reverse with this new DV added at the bottom. So, um, as we kind of flow through the evolution of the dies from three to six, we kind of notice some interesting things. First of all, as they move to from original reverse dies to the copy dies, they started putting the metal content of metallic issues at the Paris Mint on the side, cuvre for copper. And you start seeing that cuve on the first dies that you see with the original Duvivier obverse and the copy die reverse. And they started using Argent and Cuvier, 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 Cuvier um, around the 1840s. So that dates the transition. Interestingly, on the obverse die, it stayed around for quite a while. As you can see, the 1796 here, 1796 centered Duvivier here, Duvivier there. But somewhere along the way, they ended up reworking this die because the one stayed where it was, but Duvivier moved. So this die was probably re reworked while the reverse was just completely shattered and gone. Now, as I said, I was lucky enough to get a chance to look at about 100 pieces plus what's available through the um, Stax Bowers and Heritage Archives, as well as many, many contributors uh, to this effort showing me pictures. Um, 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 there's one individual who I'm blanking on right now, who um, has done some work on trying to do an inventory of all examples of um, Chester Sullivan is doing work on trying to examine all examples of the Casterland piece. So there are a fair number of dies to look at, but let's look and see how truly rare it is to get an original Casterland combined to New York Company die versus a restrike die that may have been a Napoleonic medal, may have been a medal commemorating the revolution, uh, may have been just about anything but the original Casterland story through the 1850s at the Paris Mint. Um, and the sampling that I've been able to put together from the pieces I've examined collectively from the auctions, what I've been able to acquire, what other people have done, what's in the archives. You see that on the silver dies, there's the one cliche. And then for die state one, Simon Pure, there's probably about a dozen or so in existence in various grades from uncirculated to fine. Um, and that makes sense. They were only made a handful of these things at the time. I'm sure a bunch were melted once they got into circulation. They really didn't think that they would be so busy trying to salvage the Casterland company. But 
as you look at die state two, which I think is probably the second go by the company with original dies for the company in coin turn, it begins to be the high point into the mid twenties around for the silver die in coin turn. As it goes to metal turn, it drops back down. And as the die is breaking and shattering down to just a handful. But here's the dividing point of what I think is original Simon Pure, early die, coin turn, reeded edge, small spalling later. Now, this makes sense in the flow of history. When you look at copper, it kind of makes sense too. In the beginning, you have your three patterns and you have a handful of made as commemoration to maybe some of the bigger players or potential investors. But then as things fall apart and they can't find anybody to sell to, they go way down. But then as they start gaining popularity and less expensive in copper than silver, they start to make more and more. And even as the die shatters, you see more of them. And these also grade from uncirculated to finish, although they tend to be in a bit higher grade across the board, especially in this grouping. And I put together some plates so that you can kind of see the evolution. Simon Pure, just a tiny bit of spalling, no break. But then the spalling starts growing. Coin turn, coin turn, metal turn, spalling, spalling and break. And an interesting thing happens. I kind of got confused by this, but figured it out after a while. As the bulge begins to expand, the spalling decreases, but that's because the bulge in the die raises the die and the spalling doesn't get fully struck. And you see this happen here. And by here, the die is just a catastrophe. Likewise in copper, a fairly rare example of an uncirculated die state one copper, no spalling, no break. Minimal spalling, no break. Spalling gets a lot worse and you begin to see a little bulging. The die forms, things are really messed up. Catastrophic failure. So that is where I am in my study of the Casterlin Jetons. And I'm about two thirds of the way done for an article for Jean about this. And with that, um, it's been about 50 minutes. So I've gone about five minutes too long. I'll turn it over for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Roger. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, yeah, as Roger said, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to unmute and ask them. If you are more comfortable with putting them in the chat, I'm, I'm more than welcome to, uh, to read them for you. Uh, I do have one question to get us started. Um, now, Quebec is actually much closer to Casterland than New York is. Uh, is there, was there any uh, cross communication with Quebec? I mean, uh, I understand that was a part of Canada, which was a British territory at the time. And, you know, would, you know, these Castor land colonists reaching out to Quebec maybe have be seen as, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, crossing lines with uh, the enemy because, you know, France and England have a long line of dispute and, and whatnot. Like, why didn't they reach out to Quebec at all? Well, I think there's, there's one answer and one interesting observation. Um, I think originally they believed that they would be welcome to America with open arms. They thought the Americans were going to say, these are the people that, you know, gave us our freedom. They funded the revolution. You know, they were going to love us. And I mentioned that Quebecor, uh, who was one of the great Franco-American authors and letters from an American farmer, even put together a piece that caused them to shift their beliefs kind of once they were settled in America. 
And he said, it was a curious time because at one point in time, they loved us, but as the Federalists with Washington and Hamilton and so forth came in, they adopted uh, one I wish, wish maybe we kept of neutrality, no foreign entanglements. And so they stepped back significantly from the French and left these Americans that had established a New York-based company, you know, dealing with North American Americans. As things got worse, they did think exactly that, that this is impossible to get anything from, you know, the New York ports all the way up to the Casterland, even hard to go from Albany to the Casterlands. And Faroe wanted to go on an expedition to Quebec to find alternate sources of materials for the project. But where they were located turned out to be not a smooth flowing river, but a turbulent one. He died in the process. And I think the whole, but he was he was attempting to get to Lake Ontario and to Quebec for maybe different forms of funding because they'd run out of money, different investors, people that might help them that were a little bit more familiar with the terrain and the cold. Um, you know, there were some battles that happened near and about that area back in the revolution with Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, but it was just pure wilderness. And it was just impossible to get there and Faro died trying. Hmm. Interesting. So they're trying to still bank off of uh, the friendship that was forged uh, in the revolution and before. Until they, until they were kind of at their last, you know, they had given up on that. They'd been snubbed by Thomas Jefferson in particular and several others of the founders. And they thought about turning to Canada. Thoreau was sent to do that and he died trying. And at that point in time, Chazani said, I've had it with you guys. I'm just gonna get someone new in. Teller came and was out for himself and, and the project failed. And, and when you think, you know, when I first ran across and Jesse, you and I've talked about this, seeing this included as a Napoleonic medal, a revolutionary Napoleonic medal and some other books, um, you can see where this venture of nobles that lasted for such a short period of time, had it not been for finding the journal, would have just been erased as a footnote of a really inconceived, ill-conceived bad investment by some fleeing nobles. So Indeed. Indeed. interesting. Indeed. Uh, I see Jim McClellan has a, a question, hand raised. Oh, I, I do. Terrific talk. And I've done a little work on Castor and Lanjeton myself. Had no idea about this history. It's really, really remarkable. I can only thank you very much for this opening up this whole world. That, uh, it, it, it makes them fascinating, doesn't it? I, I've had such a good time with this. It's fascinating. Uh, I don't know that you know, but from your talk, uh, the the collection of French Jetons that I uh, donated to the ANS uh, has, I think, a one, uh, a, you know, a, a original. original copper. I'm in pure. Uh, you, you saw that then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So I had no idea. So they have, I believe they have an original Simon pure copper and silver. The copper ones are, well, they're all rare, but the copper ones are extremely rare. Well, the, the one that I donated, though, has spalding and no break on it. So, uh, uh, you know, it seems to me to be not quite the one uh, that, that you were talking about. I don't know that you're, you know. Die, about state, by, die state 2. Yeah. yeah. Reeded edge. Yeah. Compensatory mm -hmm. versus metal medallic. Mm -hmm. du mm -hmm. You know, Duvivier has been booted out. He's long gone. You know, they're looking at this. What is this? This is just some Napoleonic medal. We got to make it for people that want Napoleonic medal collections. Absolutely. Terrific. Well, thank you again. Learned a lot. Indeed. Uh, yeah, before this, I was only really acquainted with these uh, jetons from the Red Book. And, you know, of course, that doesn't give you too much information. I knew of their existence, but uh, it's kind of interesting that they're in with the colonial coins. Now, clearly, this is a post-colonial, you know, post-1776, post-Constitution uh, uh, date range we're talking about. But it's really intriguing to think that people are still trying to establish colonies in, 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 the, in established United States. So it's really, really intriguing. 
So well, they kind know, of knew it, fit. What I found interesting was they were contemplating this as a new French Republic within America. Mm. So they had their own social order, their own constitution, their own currency, their own, uh, you know, um, rules of the way they were going to live. And it was all, you know, they had this kind of Ben Franklin and Passé kind of view of how they were going to live their lives as gentlemen farmers, but it didn't turn out that way. Uh, any other questions? Roger, David Fanning here. Um, David. Hi, could you say a few words about uh, your feelings on the rarity of the originals? Um, I think on Die State 1, and I'm going to try to put this together, there's about 12 or 13 Die State 1s. In fact, I'm trying to see if I have my notes here where I actually record how many I have of each one. But about 12 or 13 of the silvers on Die State 1 and about 7-ish um, in copper, one in brass. I actually was able to see the brass one in hand. It's quite mm. remarkable and remarkably early die state. This was uh, in the Garrett collection. Um, uh, the die state twos that have tiny bit of spalling, um, coin turn, reeded edge, probably... Twenty-ish in silver, maybe about five in copper, six in copper. Um, I should have had my chart where I, you know, like everybody's working on articles, I have a chart with my my uh, five and a cross tag. But th roughly, that's what I remember. All right, thanks. And, I'll, and this will be in the article, both the population dispersion and the amount, and I'm going to try to list the grades. It, it's um, interesting to me that half of them, at least, are circulated, which means that they got them and said, okay, here's some money to spend. Here's two days' right. worth of I got for a board meeting. But, you right. know, I, I was yeah. really fascinated to see the hike in the number of ones in Die State 2 in silver, which really matches with, we've got a crisis here, we're meeting all the time, mm -hmm. and the decline in the copper ones that were to give to additional subscribers, at least that's my theory, you know, fall off because no one's buying. Right. All right. Well, very good. We'll look forward to your article. Yeah, we actually had a question in the chat about, uh, have you written this up so far or as an article? And if so, how, we, how do we find it? Uh, you haven't written it up yet, but it is, you're planning for the Journal of Early American Numismatic, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, I was thinking between Gene and MCA, but I've gotten a, uh, you know how assertive Chris McDowell can be. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me he'll do what he has to do. The, the, the thing that will become important when I publish it is being able to really pick up those nuances on the images, because that's what helps you distinguish each die state. Um, I'm about two thirds done. I'm uh, probably going to try to wrap it up by the end of the year. We're also trying to wrap up the second edition of the New Jersey book by the end of the year. So I'm a busy numismatist. I don't know where I found time for work before. <laughs> Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much, Roger. If there's any other questions, uh, we can uh, gather them and, and get them to Roger and, and have uh, him answer you that way.